with kind words. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and thank you for inviting us. This is uh, really a great pleasure, a great honor, and, and we're overwhelmed by the generosity and kindness and expression of love that we meet here. Uh, both of us would talk, but I think given the time limits, I, we better only have one speaker. So let me uh, sum up quickly what we would like to say, but this is our, we work together on this paper. Uh, Jamal Murhoja asked us to speak about the significance of the Kenan Rafa'i chair in China. Now, as was just explained, we inaugurated that chair in uh, <coughs> 2002 at the Institute uh, of Advanced Humanistic Studies in Beijing University, the most important university in China. The institute was founded by Professor Du Weiming uh, in 2010 shortly after he returned from China, after teaching for 30 years at Harvard University. We uh, spent a semester there, we taught two courses, we attended many seminars, we organized a seminar uh, conference, uh, we had many good students. I just want to say a few words about what the significance of that chair is. Now, from the outset, it was our understanding that the first task of a chair like this should be to help the Chinese Muslims reestablish the links with their own intellectual tradition. Now, it is perhaps unnecessary to point out that the 20th century was disastrous for Islam in China. Muslims had lived in China for 1,500 years and had founded flourishing communities in many parts of the country. Today, there are at least 40 million. I mean, the official number is 20 million, but everyone else estimates something higher. After the Communist Revolution of 1949, all forms of religion and tradition were treated as the enemy in practice, if not in theory. Islam was singled out for special persecution, not least because it has always been considered a foreign import. Still today, many Muslims hide their Islamic identity because of the severe prejudice against Muslims. Now, one of the results of the persecution for 70 years was that a generation of scholars, at least one, perhaps two generations of scholars, was lost. And the intellectual links with the past were broken. When China opened up to the West, to the outside world 30 years ago, Muslim communities were able to send students abroad with the aim of regaining Islamic knowledge. A new generation of scholars and ulama has appeared, but they have received their training in places like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. They have some knowledge of Quran, Hadith, and Sharia, but they tend to be indoctrinated with the ideologies of the Islamist movements, political Islam. Moreover, they have no training in the intellectual fields like Sufism and philosophy. And it is the Sufi and philosophical dimensions of Islam that had determined the nature of Islam of their ancestors. In other words, the new ulama come back to China without the Islamic learning that would allow them to understand the teachings of the great Chinese Muslims of the past. Now, perhaps the best way to understand the difference between the new forms of Islam in China 
And the Islam of the past is to observe the difference between the traditional and the modern architecture of Chinese mosques and madrasas. Wherever there are sizable Muslim populations, new mosques are sprouting up like mushrooms. Financed mostly by Saudi money, these are gaudy, concrete monstrosities. In contrast, the few old mosques that were not destroyed during the Cultural Revolution are barely distinguishable, distinguishable from Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist temples. They are beautiful examples of traditional Chinese architecture, seamlessly integrated with their natural and social surroundings. They illustrate the Far Eastern and Islamic ideal of balance and harmony, an ideal that is, of course, displayed in mosques all over the Islamic world. In the Chinese case, you can only recognize that they are mosques from up close, when much of the calligraphy, which looks like Chinese, turns out to be Arabic. The insides of these mosques are unquestionably Muslim places of prayer, even if the general ambiance is fully harmonious with traditional Chinese forms. Now, the contrast between traditional and modern Chinese mosques is reflected in the intellectual discord between traditional and modern Chinese Islam. The old-style Islamic thoughts fits seamlessly into Far Eastern civilization, and the new style attacks traditional Chinese and Islamic forms like noxious and destructive weeds. Traditional Chinese Islam harmonizes with Chinese civilization for one main reason, which is that it is thoroughly imbued with the inner dimension of Islamic teachings, what is commonly called tasawwuf. This rootedness allowed the Chinese Muslims to see the splendor of the truth resonating in Chinese civilization. They took seriously the teaching that God sent prophets to all peoples, and they saw prophetic wisdom in Chinese forms, even if they thought that most Chinese had lost touch with the real meaning of that wisdom. The ability to see into and beyond external forms is, of course, a hallmark of Sufi teachers throughout Islamic history. We've heard a lot about that in the last two days. We were introduced, the two of us, to Chinese Islam in 1994, when we attended a conference on the dialogue between Confucian and Islamic civilization in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. One of the Chinese presenters uh, gave a paper on Wang Dayu, who wrote the first book on Islam in the Chinese language, published in 1642. We were fascinated by the paper. And upon returning to the United States, Dr. Murata found several Chinese books by Wan Dayu and other Muslims in the Yenching Library at Harvard. We decided to study one of the books of Wan Dayu and Professor Du Weiming, who had also attended the conference in Kuala Lumpur, agreed to read the text along with us. As we gradually discovered, Wan Dayu stood at the beginning of a movement that lasted into the beginning of the 20th century, though it was largely eclipsed by the turmoil that followed. Modern scholars have commonly called this movement the Han Kitab, that is Chinese Arabic, the Chinese books. Dozens of Muslim scholars after Wan Dayu published Chinese language books on Islam, and these scholars came to be known as the Huiru, the Muslim Confucians. They were called Confucian because of their firm grounding in the Confucian classics and their remarkable ability to express the teachings of Islam 
in the language that had been familiar to the intellectual elite of China for centuries. Professor Du, who's a very, very busy man, and he always has been, Professor Du agreed to assist us in our study of Wan Dayu because he, like us, recognized in these texts an example of religious dialogue much more profound and meaningful than the sort of discussions that usually go on today. We found this especially true when, after five years of studying Wan Dayu, we turned our full attention to a second Muslim scholar, Liu Ji, who began publishing at the beginning of the 18th century. He is a perfect example of a Muslim Confucian. He was thoroughly versed in Neo-Confucianism, which is the school of thought that has dominated East Asian intellectual history over the past 1,000 years. This is a form of Confucianism that integrates Taoism and Buddhism and, and developed many, many teachings about the Tao, the universe, and the relationship, the interrelationship between man and the cosmos. Luci, on the basis of his profound Islamic and Confucian learning, wrote a trilogy about Islamic teachings. The first volume deals with the overall worldview of Islam, the second with the rationale behind Islamic rituals and social practices, and the third with the life of the prophet, who is the embodiment of Islamic theory and practice. Now, in order to understand the significance of the Muslim Confucian synthesis developed by Wanda, Liuji, and many others, we need to keep in mind the manner in which Islamic thought developed over history, especially in the Persianate lands of Islam, which extended from Albania to China, including Turkey, of course, where Persian was even more important than Arabic in many ways. For example, although Al-Ghazali was widely known and universally recognized as a great synthesizer of the various branches of Islamic learning, his influence was overshadowed by later figures who wrote books addressed to a wider audience. Some of the best examples of these later authors are poets like Mevlana and Hafez who were among the most influential propagators of the mature Islamic worldview. This poetry is permeated with explanations of key themes of Islamic thought, but it is readily accessible to any Persian speaker. Throughout most of the Persian eight lands, Mevlana was a far more influential teacher of Islam than Al-Ghazali was even if we have not yet found much evidence that the Persian poets were important in China. And for that matter, Al-Ghazali was almost unknown in China. The most influential author among the Confucian Muslims seems to have been Ibn Arabi. No surprise, I think. As seen through the filter, the filter of Persian authors, books written by Aziz Nasifi and Abdurrahman Jami. And I could talk for hours about these two, but uh, now, these are two of the major scholars whose books were translated into Chinese. The third scholar, and we only have three, only four books before the 20th century were translated from Persian Arabic into Chinese. The third scholar was Najbuddin Razi, the author of Mirsad al which became the most popular textbook of Islamic teachings among the Chinese Muslims. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book explaining the whole vision of Islam. Now, Ibn Arabi's popularity throughout the Persianate world derived from the fact that he offered a vision of God, the universe, and the human soul that was far more comprehensive than that offered by any other Muslim thinker before or after him. The major characteristic of the worldview that he developed 
the broad outlines of which were shared by most other Muslim scholars, can be called anthropocosmism, a heavy word. But our friend Professor Lu Weiming uses this word to describe the Far Eastern worldview as developed by the great Neo-Confucian thinkers. An anthropocosmic vision is one that looks at the universe and the human self as two sides of the same living reality. Now the Muslim Confucians recognize that this Islamic anthropocosmic vision translated easily into Confucian terminology because of the parallels with Chinese thought. If they base their major teachings on specific texts by Nasafi, Jami, and Razi, it was precisely because these texts provide a clear and systematic examples of the Islamic anthropocosmic vision. Now, if you ask Muslims today, which Arabic text should be translated into other languages, most would respond, oh, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, uh, perhaps Kalam, maybe Al-Ghazali. The Confucian Muslims, however, did not translate any Arabic books. I mean, bits and, of course, they quoted Quran, but they never translated the whole thing. Uh, they read Arabic. They were ulama. They knew very good Arabic. But the issue for them was not, what do you need to know to be a scholar of Islam? The issue was, what does the Muslim community need to know to understand the Islamic worldview and to live in accordance with the Islamic worldview? No, it is good to teach people how to say their prayers and perform the rituals, recite the Quran, and observe Islamic law. But how do you explain to them, in their own language, the necessity of doing these teachings? In other words, you cannot simply tell people that you must do X, Y, and Z, because God says so. Even if most mullahs tell people exactly that, if people are to accept and follow certain guidelines, they must have good reasons to do so. Given that the Islamic guidelines shape every dimension of human life, the rationale needs to be stronger than the rationale for anything else. This was the quandary faced by the Confucian Muslims. The Muslims in China, I should say. How do you explain convincingly in the Chinese language, the worldview lying behind Islamic ritual and social teachings. How do you explain Tawheed in Chinese? The Huiru solved their quandary by writing and translating books that explain the meaning of existence, the role of human beings in the universe, the consequences of human actions, and the necessity for prophetic guidance. In order to carry these, eyes, these ideas over into the Chinese language, they had to be masters of Chinese thought. And that meant thorough familiarity, not only with Neo-Confucianism, but also with Taoism and Buddhism. These issues of the meaning of human life and the reasons for existence are precisely the issues that are addressed most clearly, most specifically by the Sufi teachers. Now, let us conclude by saying that the 400 years between the death of Al-Ghazali and the death of Abdurrahman Jami was one of the most creative and productive periods in Islamic intellectual history. Practically all of the great philosophers, theologians, Sufis, and poets who appeared during this period saw reality in terms of an anthropocosmic vision. And it was this vision that they expressed in their works. They understood the goal of human life to be the, to be the achievement of a transformed 
perception of reality in which man and the universe function in perfect harmony. They saw the road leading to this vision as embodied in the prophets, beginning with Adam and culminating with Muhammad and including Confucius. Without knowledge of the manner in which these Muslim sages and thinkers expressed this unitary anthropocosmic vision and how they understood it as the very vision of the Quran, it is impossible to see that the line of transmission of Islamic thought from Al-Ghazali down to Wan Dayu, Liu Qi, and other Muslim Confucians is unbroken. If Chinese Muslims today cannot grasp that the principles and most of the details of their ancestors' thought are drawn directly from sophisticated expressions of the Islamic vision written by great Muslim scholars, they will imagine that they must reject their own intellectual heritage. They will try to reinvent the Islamic vision on the basis of learning imported from the West and from the various politicized forms of Islam that dominate so much of contemporary discourse in the Middle East. It is the task of the Kenan Rafa'i chair in China to remind Chinese Muslims of the rich resources for understanding the human situation that are already present in their own language. Thank you.